course, sitting down from Carrick Fergus, but um, it was very sporty, very sporty. Anyway, of course you always, the helmsman always wore a tie. You knew who the helmsman was. Yes, yeah. But Noel Guinness was so keen on sailing that uh, he used to come down from some lessons on his bicycle and put the bicycle aboard the boat and he and his hand would sail the boat round to Dublin and he'd get to the nearest bit of Dublin quayside that he would come alongside. He'd hop on his bike and ride into the office and college green and the paid hand was then required during the course of the day to sail the boat round to Malahide. <laughs> and came close to business then, Noel Guinness would get on his bicycle and cycle out to Malahide, get himself on the bicycle aboard the boat and sail to Hove. <laughs> as being a satisfactory way of rounding out a day's work. I am not, I'm not making this up. There was no television in those days. No, no online betting. What on earth did you do? Anyway, go on, this is Noel Guinness. Uh, and more to the point, the judge owned the share. He probably owned Aura outright. Anyway, this is Judge Boyd, getting into his 80s sailing single-handed in the in the aura and i'm afraid the news on the thalaya isn't good because she was built on steel frames she, she was pretty well on fire for most of her life with her trellises and she was so big that each winter she was laid up in the grand canal dock in dublin and i think after about the winter of 1911-1912 the fun she wasn't really fit to leave so she motored away to a sorry end in the Grand Canal Basin. But meanwhile, the judge had the aura, and um, here she is being launched. And um, see what I mean about the compact cockpit. But he continued, he was allowed to continue sailing until the end of 1915. But at that stage, there were too many German U boats in the Irish Sea. And so sailing discontinued. They made him a baronet in 1916, he died in 1918, and his son, Walter Herbert, everybody knew him as Herbert, he became Sir Walter Boyd, Baronet, owner of the yacht Ethne, and continuing as Commodore of Hoth Sailing Club. And the class that he designed, thriving. I mean, they're, they're, they're just super little boats. As you see, Roddy Cooper's got a very good start. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, we, um, but this is interesting, by the way. This is the program for 1899. And if we go down it, Commodore and the whole lot, but if we go down to the sailing instructions, um, start, starting line, start, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yes, there it is. Start. Yes. The time to be taken by Findlater's clock. <laughs> Mock not. Mock not. We saw the next one. There's Finn Lader's clock. And it was a sure thing. It was so sure people used to gather to hear it chime. This is a club known as the Peer Group. <laughs> Awful lot of things happened in both. <coughs> meanwhile, as I say, Dublin Bay Sailing Club had taken up the class, and this, of course, swelled numbers hugely. They got their boats mostly built by James Kelly and Port Rush. The some were also built by Clancy. Some were built by Holway. He was a sort of gentleman boat builder. I think he was Jenny Guinness's great uncle in, um, in Ringsend. And um, it's a handy little committee boats in those days. Hope the yacht club, please note. Do you think that a star, star point or whatever she's called is something? That's what a committee boat should look like. <laughs> anyway, they, they now had critical mass and they had great racing. And, um, and of course, the Kaiser went and ruined everything. But meanwhile, well, this is a little diversion. 
This is what happens when you let Kingston types get hold of your back. <laughs> now, this is from the 1930s, admittedly, but we thought we'd just slot it in here. This is the Eileen, which has been known forever by the Lynch family, I you thought. But during the 1930s, she was owned by Terry Roach. And he decided she, she needed to be Bermuda rigged. So this was the result. And um, just to prove that it was a seaworthy really sealed her to Hollyhead and back. But he admitted later she carried Lee Helm, which of course you can see is obvious she would carry Lee Helm. He moved the whole centre effort forward. But anyway, this is, um, mostly those are water rides, by the way. There's just this lone Bermuda rig, Dublin A17. But anyway, we, we go on. The judge, as I say, he was finally made a baronet and 1916. The other historic thing to happen was the um, the Ascot. I have to report that there is absolutely no link whatever between the Ascot and the whole 17s. There's no connection, there's no record. The Saturday when the Ascot at the end of July 1914 was up behind Lamb Bay, it blew a gale from the northwest, so there's no racing at all. It's still blowing smoke on the Sunday, as you can see. This is the Sunday. This is where Molly Childers sailed the Asgard into Hoth. And I like to think that she came in just maybe with the stasis set and the mizzen and was able to bring her around head to wind at the mid where they, um, there's Molly, about to leave, in fact. But I'd like to think that she managed to throw beautiful devils. All the photos show the Asgard pointed west, and uh, there's nothing of her. They had Gordon Shepherd to take the lines, to leave the teams taking the lines to get her stopped. But uh, the mainsail was torn by over enthusiasm, so they're leaving. That's Molly Chill, who's about to help the Asgard away with the trisel set. And if we go back to the full picture, We'll see the um, you see the whole 17s bouncing around in the background. It's blowing good and fresh out of the northwest. It, it, I must say, Kosersky Childers himself was a bit of a disaster at the helmsman. He was cruised to the Baltic in 1914, 1912. He left his mizzen mast hanging out of the bar of a German battleship, <laughs> which is not a good idea when you work for the government, but. Um, <laughs> Molly was a much better Helms person. And um, anyway, that's about all the link I'm afraid we can get to the most sail famous sailing event in Hull, is that the Hull 17s were bouncing about in the ruins when the Asgard <laughs> came and went. End of, end of that story. On we move now. Um, Interwar period. Classic Hull regatta. The sun is shining, and it'll be raining by the evening. Don't worry, you can be sure of it. And um, a good turn out of 17s, and John Carney's Mavis is there as well. So this is God's in his heaven and all well with the world. And um, in the winter, some of the 17s laid up in Higgy's Pond along the Borough Road. As your man, Freddie Higginbotham, as an architect in Dublin who was also a consultant engineer to um, Hoth Urban District Council, the used to be Hoth Urban District Council. And the main contractor to Hoth Urban District Council was William Lacey and Company and Sons Limited. And um, between the, these two boroughs had founded themselves the Hoth Motor Yacht Club. And um, Higgy's Pond, there's no quarry hole, it's still there. It's now called the lake. And the big boat there is Billy Mooney's 80s. You may have seen her sister ship, the Maybird, in here for the left. But that's a whole 17 in the foreground. And um, anyway, they had tidal gates, they had floodgates. And uh, in the winter of 1937 38, uh, it blew an easterly gale for about five weeks, and uh, the whole place silted up. So they got the entire labouring staff of the whole Urban District Council to come and spend five, another five weeks digging the channel out again. 
and the Hills Urban District Council's funding never really recovered thereafter. <laughs> it was wound up in some ignominy in, in 1943, but we digress because here we have the first known picture, of course, the is back to us, going out under the, the sluice, the floodgates. All this is now gone and out. <coughs> and that's Norman Wilkinson. And he went off and uh, had a good war, as they say, <coughs> and he came back in 1947. He really hoped to revive the National 18 class, in which he'd been quite a power in both the three or four of them here in the late 1930s. But there weren't any about it, so he, he bought the Leela that she offered the only chance of racing. Leela, the whole 17, and um, this became part of, anyway, he bought the Leela uh, in Ayat, and then coming up to the centenary of the class. And there you were, you were buying already quite a famous <coughs> boat. And, um, what do you, can you remember what you thought? I thought it was paying far too much money for a very old boat. And he kept it for another 60 years, won everything, <laughs> including, including the 75th anniversary. So then, meanwhile, other families were getting involved. And um, now this, I don't know whether the show will go on after this. Um, the angelic child in the foreground is, of course, Roger Courtney. And, not Courtney, Cagney, sorry. No. This, this image is jinxed actually because as soon as we tried to feed it into the system all the order of the previous ones fell apart. So whether the show will go on after this or not I don't know. But anyway, as I say, in those days the whole 70s were seen as nice little family savers. And um, there's the mimosa. And that, that's the Courtney family. So that's Clem Courtney at the helm, proved by Peggy Corbett, who later became his daughter-in-law. And um, alas, the mimosa is the only one of two 17s to have been lost. At least we don't know if she's lost. Sean Cullen might know where she is. <laughs> uh, when he's on his Infomar boat. But anyway, she sank off the Bailey. Fortunately, without loss of life, thanks to thanks to the Skian brothers, who made a really brilliant rescue. That was as near, the sinking of Mimosa actually in 1984 was as near as the class has ever been to the totality. And um, anyway, that's a classic old Saturday afternoon. Just the sheer fun of sailing all 17. It was around this time that poor old Herbert Boyd finally popped his clogs. And, uh, we had to get a new Commodore in 1948. Nobody knew how to go about it. <laughs> so I think they just asked Noel Guinness would he mind standing in for about 20 years or something like that. <laughs> and meanwhile, the whole motor yacht club. Ross Courtney normally would have been racing the Mimosa. And um, if you just go back to the Mimosa for a moment. And he, he made his base in the motor yacht club on the West Pier as much as in the sailing club on the East Pier. And on a breezy day, he was the top helm. On a breezy day, they'd seen putting a lot of reefs in and everything. So everybody else across the harbour would put in reefs. And Ross would go out, and he'd go round the outside of the West Bay and I'd take both reefs out and put up the tops of them. <laughs> and everybody else would come out, all reefed out and everything, without the time to put up sail, and Ross would murder them. <laughs> <laughs> But um, the class went on, as designed by Herbert Boyd, the two new boats, Isabel and Erica, built in 1988 by, by John O'Reilly. It, it was a wonderful effort. And since then, the Sheila has been built. And as Brian Turvey said, this season, I presume he means this season, we're going to have everyone except, except the Anita float. And, um, the Erica and the Isabel were built in Hoth Castle. The odd thing is there's no boat building tradition whatever in Hoth. So John O'Reilly fortunately had served his time at Dublin Boat and Docks Board under J.B. Carney. And when the building of him was going to visit Australia, they brought John O'Reilly in and as you see made a smashing job. And um, these two boats were very much because they were still regarded as the new boat. 
then I got 30 years old, right? Um, Herbert got to Meanwhile, what happened to the Ethnic? Herbert Boyd's own boat. Well, she was here and there, and I went, I set out at one stage to sail around the world, but it didn't make it there. Sean Cullen bought her in a sad state, and this is a splendid <coughs> launching in Dunleary after a restoration, which, as you can see, could have been more of a bit of deck work restoration. I don't think she ever had a deck like that. And um, as the Marguerite built 1896, Tim McGuinness got hold of her, and um, he did some like that's ethnic off both in 1994 after Shawnee restored it. Very pretty boat. And um, this is four pictures of Tim McGuinness in various stages of desperation. <laughs> <laughs> Rebuilding the, the Marguerite. And as a result of that, she has been sailing ever since. Uh, how long ago was that, Tim? That was quite a while ago. 21 years. It was, um, it was, uh, here's Tim about to launch her. Lovely job. Well done, Tim. As you can see, as you can see, it's a very long time ago because the Marguerite is still being used as a sailing boat, but the HSS has now been used as an office block. <laughs> Make it <laughs> anyway, here's the Marguerite. Over for the Land Bay race last year. Everybody came for the Land Bay race except the Land Bay race itself. <laughs> Dublin, I have to say the Met boys at Dublin Airport were absolutely spot on. They said it's going to be gusting to 40 knots right through. There won't be the slightest easing until 7 o'clock in the evening. And they were completely spot on. So um, that was it, no land bay race. But anyway, we all got another chance to admire the Marguerite. Uh, and it really, actually, this just about sums the story up. Because this is about designed by Herbert Boyd in 1896, the year after. He would have designed her in 1895, the year the sailing club was founded. And there's our club as it is at the moment in the background. And we're all hanging in together, one way or another. And, um, I can't remember how this finishes, does it for me? <laughs> oh yeah! 1998. Forgot all about this. Yeah, what did the other 17s do? 1998, the whole 17s went up to Carrick Fergus to celebrate their centenary. And this is Ian Malcolm in Aura, which you could admire sitting just outside, sailing off that same Carrick Fergus castle. It was the first time she had been there since 1898. And they sailed up and down. The weather was awful. It was the weekend the Good Friday Agreement was signed, so it was a long time ago. And um, they had all their trailers and everything to bring them back again. And they all said, well, we'll have a safe journey down the road. We'll see you Monday morning. And as soon as everybody had headed for home, they, were, they communicated like starlings on a telegraph wire. They just all turned and sailed straight out of Belfast Lock, sailed the whole damn way to home to home. 90 miles. Sub zero temperatures. I don't know how they got away with it anyway. This is the aura somewhere off the County Down coast. You can and it's only starting to get cold. <laughs> only starting to get cold. Anyway. <laughs> As I say in the airline business, if you can walk away from it, it's a landing. <laughs> <laughs> the aura does get around. This is another thing Ian had her at, um, the classic boat regatta on Loch Derg. And Aura had to go there because it offered a chance for meeting a boat even older. Aura was built in 1898. The Phoenix was built in Waterford in 1873. And beside them and around them are a bunch of water wags, most of which were built around 1900, 1901. And there's a bunch of Shannon 1 designs, most of which were built in the 1920s. So somebody sat down one day and worked out the combined age of this fleet. And he stopped when he got to 2,000 years. 